Welcome, folks. It is one o'clock and we have lots to do, so I am going to go ahead and get started. On behalf of the Student Equity Workgroup, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to our 2021 Equity Speaker Series. My name is Sangha Niyogi and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I teach sociology and I co-chair the Student Equity Workgroup along with Dean Rosa Armendaris. The overall goal of the DVC Student Equity Speaker Series is education, equity, and inclusivity to provide safe space to identify, discuss, and create solutions towards the academic and social challenges our disenfranchised low income and communities of color face in order to gain access to equitable education and economic resources. Each year, the Student Equity Workgroup chooses a theme for our speaker series. In the past, we've had themes such as undoing injustice and rise by lifting. This year, we have chosen the theme Indigeneity, Decolonize Our World. We will begin with a land acknowledgement offered by Deja Gold. Born and raised here in her ancestral territory of Huchin from the Confederated Villages of Lishan, Deja is a core member and leads land and cultural projects. She's one of the medicine makers and brings her two children to the land for seed saving, transplanting, language and cultural revitalization, including her new Chochenyo kids class. Deja, if you can do the honors. Horshatuhi, <clears throat> everyone. Um, Akoi M. Warat. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Deja Gould. I just want to say welcome to everybody. I'm welcoming you, you today from the traditional territory of Huchin. I'm very happy to do this uh, land acknowledgement. Um, <clears throat> and I also want to thank DBC for putting this, um, this series together. For everyone to watch. Um, <clears throat> I represent the Confederated Villages of Lashan. We are put, uh, we are part of what many people think of as Ohlone. Ohlone is a generic term that we are trying to get away from as we ourselves decolonize. There are eight tribal nation territories with just as many languages and creation stories. So not all Ohlone are the same. Our people have always been here in the East Bay, enslaved at both Mission Dolores in San Francisco and Mission San Jose in Fremont. <clears throat> um, so I would just like to um, say that I speak the, the language of Chochenyo, which again is from this language. And DBC is located in another part of our territory, which is known as Saklan. Um, so again, I just want to thank everybody and, and welcome everybody here and welcome our distinguished guests, Dr. Eve Tuck and Dr. Wayne Yang. Thank you. Thank you, Deja. This year, we are offering a scaffolded and comprehensive exploration of indigeneity. By focusing on the survival and resurgence of ethnic and indigenous cultures, we hope to shed light on some of the most urgent problems that need to be addressed, not only in our community, but for the entire planet. Participants are encouraged to attend all the events in the series designed to build our collective knowledge and facilitate growth. The Equity Speaker Series will be invaluable for envisioning a robust ethnic studies program at DVC Embracing a counter narrative and intersectional approach will not only inform our burgeoning program, but also have a transformative impact on how we all live, learn, and act. Please join us in this critical conversation that will lead us to 
towards strategic and cohesive action. So I hope you're all as excited as I am to get this going. Our next event is on November 18th, Wednesday at one o'clock again. That will be by Dr. Heather Ponchetti Daly, who will present on From Termination to Regeneration for California Indigenous Peoples. I would like to thank Christina Gomez and Ligia Morcillo for providing tech support today. Chris Knox and her team for helping us with marketing. Vice President Nguyen Orante for his vision and Dean Rosa Armendariz for her initiative. We also appreciate President Susan Lamb's continuing support. If you aren't able to attend the presentation you're interested in in this series, you can view it at a later time by visiting our Equity Speaker Series video streaming site. All of this information is available on the DVC Equity Speaker Series website. Please do fill out our survey at the end using the tiny URL, and I will remind you of this at the end. We are thrilled to partner with educators, scholars, and community leaders, Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang, who will facilitate the series in partnership with team members from the Sugurite Land Trust. Eve Tuck is Canada Research Chair of Indigenous Methodologies with Youth and Communities an Associate Professor of Critical Race and Indigenous Studies at the University of Toronto. Kei Wen Yang is Provost of John Muir College and Professor of Ethnic Studies at the University of California, San Diego. So now let's have virtual applause uh, for our wonderful facilitators, um, Professors Tak and Yang, please introduce yourselves. And welcome to DVC. Good afternoon. Uh, ang Ang, I'm Eve Tuck, and I am Unanga from St. Paul Island, Alaska. I grew up, si up outside of my community in Pennsylvania and lived for a long time in New York City. Prior to moving here to Toronto, I'm talking to you from Toronto. Uh, uh, homelands of Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people. I'm actually talking to you from our six-year-old's closet where I do all of my Zoom calls and Zoom activities. And my pronouns are she and her. And I'm really happy to be with my, my good friend and longtime collaborator, Kay Wayne Yang. Hello, everyone. That's why I'm smiling. I don't actually get to see Eve that often or Karina. So this is really fantastic. And um, DVC is real close to my heart, um, knowing a lot of the people who are on this call who are who, who worked there and, and lived there for a long time. Um, I also have um, a lot of community in Oakland on Chichen Ohlone land and um, very, very pleased to um, be able to offer anything to this series. Um, and I'm going to introduce Lindsay Shively really fast, who actually is going to introduce herself, um, who was the person who reached out to Karina, and you're going to tell us a little bit why, introduce Karina, and then without further ado, um, Karina is going to uh, drop some wisdom on us. So thanks so much. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lindsay. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a librarian at DDC. And I'm speaking to you from my home in Oakland, California, which is unceded Huchin territory. Um, and it is my pleasure to introduce Karina today. Um, before I do that, I'm gonna share with you a local legend. So in September of 1805, a group of men set out on horseback riding north from Mission San Jose. They were Spanish soldiers who had been sent to California to increase the wealth of their king and to enslave the people that they found here in the Franciscan mission system. Um, this group included my grandfather, seven generations back, whose name was Jose Antonio Sanchez. So the soldiers rode from Mission San Jose up through Contra Costa County. And I imagine it took them several days. I imagine it was really hot. 
in September in the East Bay, the acorns are still ripening on the oak trees and the Redwood Canyons are cool. But I don't think that the soldiers were paying attention to the natural beauty of the land when they took this trip because they were on a campaign of genocide. Their intention was to destroy the Sakhalin people who live in the land that we now call Lafayette and Moraga. Uh, Sakhalin people had been resisting colonization and the invasion of their land, and they had been um, protecting people from many different tribes who had fled from the missions, fleeing from enslavement, violence, disease, and mass rape perpetuated by the Padres and the soldiers. And in retaliation for the self-defense of the Sakhalin people, my grandfather set out to kill them and to destroy their culture. So on this trip, the soldiers passed by the sacred mountain, which had many names and many prayers have been sung at the mountain. One night, the soldiers surrounded a Chipkan village that was located next to a willow thicket on what we now call the Karkinas Strait. Uh, they suspected that the Sakhalin people were hiding in the village, um, and when they arrived, it was late at night. So they went to sleep, intending to round up the people in the morning and drag them back to the missions. But in the morning, the people were gone. They had escaped silently over the water. And my grandfather and the other soldiers were astonished by this. They decided that it must have been the work of the devil. And so they named the area around the village Monte de Diablo, which was the thicket, the willow thicket of the devil. And that name was later applied to the sacred mountain and to the valley and to the college that came afterwards. So, this is the story of how Diablo Valley College got its name um, through an act of attempted genocide perpetuated by my ancestors against the original people and rightful inhabitants of this land. And this story really fuels my commitment to decolonization work here in the Bay Area and is the reason that I am personally so honored to be welcoming Karina Gould to Diablo Valley College. We are uh, seven generations on from that first violent wave of colonization. And together, we now have an opportunity to turn away from the genocidal and extractive legacies towards a future of healing and justice. Karina is a spokesperson for the Confederated village, Villages of Lushan and a founder of Sigorite, the Urban Indigenous Women's Land Trust, located here in the East Bay. She's also a visionary and a leader, showing us possibilities of right relationship. Karina envisions and fights for a world where the water is clean, sacred sites are protected, and the people who have always tended this land continue to do so with acknowledgement and gratitude from those of us who are guests on Ohlone territory. Her leadership is essential for all of us who love this land and seek to do right by our histories, our home, and our ancestors. So please welcome, please join me in welcoming Karina Gould. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, wow, that story uh, shook me up a little bit. So, Horshetuhi Ka'at Lashanka Ka'at Ra'at Karina. Good day, relatives. My name is Karina Gould, and I am the spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashan. And Lashan is actually people that are made up of the five different tribes that were taken into Mission San Jose. And um, part of our tribal heritage is from where you all are, to, um, where DVC is, and the Sakhalin territory as well. I want to welcome um, my uh, co-hosts, uh, Dr. Eve Tuck and Dr. Uh, Wayne Yang, and it's so wonderful to be in space here with all of you today. I'm going to share a slideshow with all of you, and we're going to talk about some of the history 
of colonization that happened to my ancestors. And we're gonna move forward in history um, to present day. And we can't talk about the work that needs to be done today without looking back at what's happened in the past. And so I'm gonna talk some of that about that and I'm going to share the slide presentation. So welcome to Saklan, or um, we might be closer to Taklan um, in where DVC is right now. My ancestors were some of those folks that were lucky enough to have gotten away from the Spanish soldiers uh, in 1805 and was able to stay away from the missions for a little while longer before we were all taken in. Um, this is the pictures of our ancestors a while ago, and I like to talk about this picture, especially when we're looking um, during the fall season. In the fall season, when there we talk about uh, a, a harvest time and we talk about a time of people gathering together. And although we are at a time where we can't gather together, my ancestors would gather during this time and we would uh, gather acorns and there would be a festival and a uh, dance uh, that would happen and tribes from different places, different villages would come together. But I like to show this picture for another reason. And this picture is the picture, um, one of very few pictures that depict my ancestors at time of contact. And this picture uh, shows us in our regalia. And regalia for us is, has a special meaning. It's not a costume. And I like to specifically talk about this during this time of year because as we're going into this holiday where people like to dress up, we still find ourselves um, seeing non-native people dressing up in things that look like our regalia. And for us, our regalia is a part of uh, their living beings. Uh, my ancestors would care for their regalia in a way that you don't find yourself um, protecting or taking care of costumes. Um, something that you would buy at the Halloween shop my ancestors, when they took on the responsibility of, of dancing, they had to take on responsibilities of learning particular prayers and songs. And they would sing these songs to wake up the regalia uh, before they put them on. And they would dance for the health and well being of the people that were there and for the land and all the beings around. And as they took the regalia off, they would sing it to sleep and they would spiritually feed it. And they would take care of it throughout the year to ensure that it was it was uh, it was good, so that the the people when they put the pr um, put those prayers down would have good times. So my ancestors, when I talk about this, we're talking about not just young kids dressing up sometimes still as native people, but we're talking about college students, adults thinking that it's okay to characterize us as something that's less than human. That's not uh, a part of a culture. You cannot put on someone's culture for a night and, and then throw it away the next day. And so for me, it's about a, a sign of respect, about decolonizing our minds in a way that we respect each, each person as a human being and their belief systems um, that continue to be alive today, even through the waves of colonization that happened on our lands. My ancestors lived in villages that were close to the water, where fresh water met salt water. And our houses and our boats and our skirts and baskets and different things were made out of tule that grew along the marshes. And today when we're looking at climate destruction happening, we talk about human beings leaving a small footprint on the earth. And this part of the world where my ancestors have been since the beginning of time, we did leave that small footprint here. Just about everything we created was biodegradable. It, uh, it, it went back into the earth. The very few things that we left behind were our ancestral remains in our shell mounds and our mortars and pestles and our, and our arrowheads. And so everything we did, including our bodies, went back into the earth to nourish the land back again in a reciprocity, a way of respecting, of not taking too much. And so as we begin to look at the destruction that's happening right now, 
we have to begin to think about how do we go back into a time where we are living and leaving a smaller footprint, a way for us to not take so much. This distractive economy is killing all of us. And it wasn't that long ago in our territory, uh, 200 years ago, because California, everything that was built that you see now is only about 200 years old. So if you can imagine 200 years ago that every water, every freshwater creek in the Bay Area you could drink out of, and that salmon and rainbow trout swam up here, and that there was an abundance in our territory, that there was not even a concept of hunger or homelessness in our territory 200 years ago, that our songs came with this, uh, this way of singing the praises and thanking the creator for these ants, for everything that was given to us because there was so much here. My nephew, who is a song carrier, and he sings songs from different tribes. And he tells me this story one time. He says, Auntie, he goes, um, you know, I sing our songs, our traditional songs here from our territory. And our songs are always about abundance and thank you so much for all that we have. And, um, and then folks that are in the middle of the country, they have different kinds of songs. Their songs are because they come from harsh times when there's a harsh winters and, and there's little to eat asking, or the songs are asking to help us because we're pitiful. So our, our, we know that our ancestors had so much here that they lived in, a, in reciprocity with the land so that the land gave us what we needed and we were able to take care of the land so it continued to help feed us and the future generations. For thousands of years, we lived like that until the missionaries came with Spanish soldiers and I like to talk about this story because I think a lot of people don't understand how Spain actually got what is now called California. Because if you know what calling dibs is, then that's kind of how Spain got California. You see this guy named Cabrillo, he was on a ship and he was coming down the coast of California in about 1546. And he noticed a lot of smoke on the land. And the smoke was there because my ancestors had traditionally lit fires so that they can clean the underbrush of the forests that were here. This was a living in reciprocity again with the lands around us because uh, by doing that, by setting those fires intentionally, it would help the seeds that needed that fire to propagate. And it would uh, help us with making sure that the fields that we used to have seeds, wild seeds that we ate, uh, replenished for the following year. And that the little shoots that would come up that we would need to make our baskets and our arrowheads, I mean, our arrow shafts, um, would also feed the deer um, as they came underneath the canopy that was opened up because of the fires. And that would bring meat to our people. And so living in that reciprocity, we would feed the animals, we would use that as well as br to bring them in. And so there was this way of being on the land for thousands and thousands of years. Then uh, Cabrillo went, came, he claimed California for Spain and the crown around that time when he saw that smoke. He didn't come onto the land. He never met my ancestors here in this territory. He went all the way down to San Diego and, and got there and about four days later he died, um, but not before he claimed this land. And actually Spain left for a couple of hundred years. They didn't come back. Um, it was them, they came back because they were afraid they were gonna lose the land that they called dibs on. They were afraid because the Russians were doing fur trade with, um, with the California native people in Northern California and they were afraid they were gonna lose the land base they called dibs on. And so they knew that they had used this tactic of Spanish missions in what is now called Mexico and the indigenous people by enslaving them in these places. And they thought that that would be a great idea to do that here to hold down that land. And so this man named Junipero Serra was excited about coming to our territories from San Diego all the way up to Sonoma to hold down the land um, and, to, uh, and to create slavery and genocide on our people, quite frankly. It was, uh, a, they used our people as a work force. Um, 
and there was 21 missions that were built on this stolen land. My ancestors were enslaved in two of those missions, Mission Dolores in San Francisco and Mission San Jose in Fremont, California. You see, the Spanish didn't bring enough humans to actually build these missions. My ancestors built the missions and then were enslaved in these missions. And so what I like to call the first prison industrial complex of California was built by Spain and by the Catholic Church. My ancestors made the adobes to build these churches that they were forced to be in. And once they were baptized, could not leave and go back to their own villages. Um, so the Spanish church brought a lot of things. They brought disease and rape. They brought murder. They brought flogging. Um, and they brought malnutrition. You see, they brought these animals that were grazers into our territory and animals that were not indigenous to our lands. They brought cows and sheep and goats and donkeys and pigs here that changed the waterways and dirtied the waterways and ate the foods and the medicines that our people would need in order to survive. Um, and these animals that grazed, nobody knew that that was going to happen, but that was what happened uh, when they were allowed to graze through our lands. Uh, my ancestors were introduced to these foods and got sick and uh, the medicines were gone that would have helped them because the animals grazed them away. My ancestors uh, were uh, also got sick from diseases that were brought here, pox and typhoid and syphilis. And my ancestors um, were given food uh, that had less nutritional value than people were given um, in Auschwitz. And so my ancestors went from being 100% in, in our territories to being, um, being taken down to about 10% of the population. But the Spanish missions only lasted for 99 years, which was a, a very short amount of time. When people come here, they think of they were are miseducated um, in the public school, district, public school system. Uh, we were taught that there was Costa Noans. The Spanish gave us this name, people from the coast, and not realizing that there's actually eight different nations of people with eight different creation stories with many villages in one language territory. So the way I explain it is if you think about a, a county, um, and the county has many different cities within it, and we all speak the same language, it was kind of the same way with our territories. Our people um, had their own way of being of running their sovereign nations within those territories and spoke the same languages. So my ancestors actually come from the Chochenyo speaking language area, the Karkin area on both sides of the Karkina Strait, the Bay Miwok area where you all are at right now in DVC, and we're also Northern uh, Yokuts. And so our territory is quite large uh, when we have to take care of the many things in our territories. Mexico came and stole the land a second time after the Spanish um, and they continued the enslavement of the indigenous people. And the way that this happened was interesting because our ancestors, when the Spanish missions closed down, um, they, uh, Mexico had won its independence from Spain and decided that the Spanish churches had too much land and so they squished down the land that the churches held and gave out huge swaths of land to uh, Spanish soldiers. So people like Peralta and Bernal and Vallejo and many other people that came and were uh, soldiers were given thousands and thousands of acres of land. And my ancestors quite literally went from being uh, prisoners and slaves at the missions to prisoners um, and slaves on these ranchos. And so the land came with the Indians on it. And we don't have a lot of history about what happened to, the, uh, to our ancestors, except we know that they worked on the ranchos for the people that now had the land. There was nowhere else to go because our land was literally given away to someone else. And so um, went to, uh, to working from them. In the Bay Area, in the East Bay, where I currently live, I live in my traditional territory of Huchin on the border of Irgin. Um, El, um, 
the Rancho de San Antonio or the Peralta land was given. And, and that's from San Leandro to uh, about Albany, California. And my ancestors um, were enslaved here at this time, uh, during this period of time. Um, and you can see that there was Sobrante and Panol and other places, people that owned these lands now um, in, uh, during this rant, land grant. In 1848, Mexico and America had a war and the land that was, was stolen for a third time by the United States. And instead of slavery, it was now about mass extermination. And so there was this treaty, the Treaty of Guadalupe de Hidalgo. And in the Treaty of Guadalupe de Hidalgo, it said not only were the land grants supposed to be um, uh, enforced and they were supposed to keep their land, land was supposed to be given back to the native people. And true to its form, the United States government broke this treaty as well. California was created and some of the very first laws of California made it illegal to be Indian in California. California spent $1.4 million backed by the federal government killing California native people $5 a head and 25 cents an ear. And so our ancestors had to go into hiding. There were, um, everyone came, you hear about our ancestors in fourth grade history about the Ohlone people or the Bay Miwok people or the Plains Miwok people in the Bay Area. And then we learn about how they used to dress and how they used to eat and how they used to do a lot of things. And then we go rushing into fifth grade into the gold rush and we don't hear about native people anymore. And we definitely don't hear about the history of our people being hunted down. We don't hear about the fact that our, there were uh, laws also intact. There were vagrancy laws. And this, this makes me really weary right now when we talk about the vagrancy laws that happened to my ancestors and the thousands of people that are now in our territory that are living without shelter and the laws that are being passed that incriminate them. So the vagrancy laws in California were against native people and it allowed, to have, allowed slavery to happen. Uh, because a native person could not speak against a white person in a court of law. Uh, they could be taken into a court of law, a native person could be taken into a court of law, claimed to be vagrant, and the court could give this rancher, this person, this human being, uh, for up to 25 years um, as free labor, as long as they could feed and clothe them. People would go into villages of native people and kill off the adults and get the bounty for their heads and ears and take the little children into town and sell them off $300 for a little girl, $180 to $200 for a little boy. And here there began a different kind of disconnect of native families um, during that time. So my ancestors did quite literally go into hiding and pretended that they were Mexican and they lived on a ranch in Pleasanton, California very close to where the Alameda County Fairgrounds are today. We survived that and then we went into boarding schools and into Indian foster care. And our boarding schools, our, our families were again ripped apart and the children were sent far away. My mom and my auntie and uncle uh, were sent to Chamawa Boarding School in Oregon, which is still open today. And um, my auntie went into Indian foster care uh, when she was about 12 years old. About four years ago, my auntie tells this story about how she had, uh, and she hadn't told this story to her own daughters. Two of my cousins were sitting in the living room and, and we were sitting there and she began to tell us the story about leaving boarding school and going to work for a family in San Leandro. And um, she said, you know, at boarding school, they taught them how to become maids and domestic workers. And so she went to live with this family and she washed their clothes and she took care of their kids and then she cooked and she cleaned and she did that. And she said, oh, it was such a really nice white family. They, they really took care of me. They were so nice. They wanted to send me to school. And the city of San Leandro um, said no uh, because she was too dark. Now, mind you, my auntie is still alive. She's living in, um, in Oakland. Um, and so she's in, she's, uh, in her mid eighties. And this happened in our lifetimes. 
that are the prejudice and racism that was happening, uh, happened to our people. And so they continue to hide. My auntie ended up getting married at the age of 14 and having eight children. She became a uh, waitress at a restaurant in Alameda at the Acapulco, uh, where she uh, stayed and retired um, when she was around in her 60s. We stay hidden because um, it was a time where it was scary to be native. In our, our elders were afraid for us to talk about who we were, uh, afraid of the discrimination, afraid of being jailed, afraid of uh, the terrible things that had continued to happen. And then um, we come to my generation. And it's been my generation that's been able to stand up and to begin to talk about who we are and that we're still here. This picture is actually put up um, during the Occupy movement in Oakland. And in 1990s, we began doing work around the protection of sacred sites. I did. My friend Janella LaRose and I started doing work uh, when the base closures happened in the Bay Area. And you know, young people on here may not know, but uh, in 1999 or before that, there was no internet really. There was no uh, internet the way that we see it today. That really blew up around that time in the Bay Area. And we talk about waves of gentrification that's happening now. It was happening then when the internet blew up and big tech was, was here and people were outbidding each other for houses and apartments. And buildings started happening like we see today. We see these cranes in the sky and I'm not talking about birds. I'm talking about these big metal structures that are, are building these huge high rises in our, our cities right now. Well, in 1909, the same similar thing was happening that there was construction happening all over the Bay Area. And this man, Nels Nelson, created a map of our shell mounds. Shell mounds are our burial sites, our village sites, our places of ceremony along the water. And I believe that my ancestors was in the ear of a couple of different people. I believe that he was in Nels Nelson's ear to create this map before I was born, before my mother was born to give us a direction of where we are still connected to. J.P. Harrington is another guy that I think that was connected to my ancestors because he was this crazy linguist who knew all of these native languages were going to sleep. And he went around and took massive amounts of uh, notes and has my great grandfather's songs on wax cylinder at the Smithsonian so we can get that language and revitalize it again. But Nels Nelson, he knew that these shell mounds were important. And in 1909, he, he worked at UC Berkeley. 1909, he created this map. And everywhere you see these little tiny numbers on this map is a shell mound. He found 425 of them that ring the Bay Area at that time. He didn't get all of them, but he got most of them. Uh, by going and finding and looking along the bay where that fresh water met that salt water, like I was talking about, where these mounds were created by my ancestors. We buried our ancestors. This horrible word came from Europe and called them midden. And midden is an archaeological term that means dung heap or garbage dump. My ancestors didn't bury our, our relatives in garbage heaps. They were cemeteries. They were placed down in particular ways and covered with soil and shell and, and rock. And over thousands of years, they grew sometimes to be over three stories high, like the one in Emeryville. My ancestors buried meticulously. And on top of those shell mounds, they became points of that you could look across the bay and see the fires of other villages along the way. It was a couple hundred years ago, there wasn't electricity here. And so my ancestors lived with our ancestors in our backyard, just like every other culture in the world. We buried our relatives right next to us. They were our part of our ongoing 
life. And so these shell mounds became endangered in 1909 and they continue to be in danger today. See the one in Emeryville that I was talking about was three stories high. And it was three and a half foot, it was two and a half football fields in diameter. It was a monument of the world. You see our shell mounds are older than the pyramids of Egypt. They are our places of reverence. The one in Emeryville was like your hand. It was a large shell mound and then it had smaller ones that came off of it. It was a place where my ancestors buried, but it was a place of trade. It was a place of, of uh, uh, where our Western gate is also seen. All along the coast our, is our point of reference is our Western gate. Our Western gate is uh, where the Golden Gate Bridge is a place called Alcatraz, where people know as this uh, place that people wanna go to and visit because it was an old prison, it was a place that my ancestors, we believe that their spirits sat there and waited while we were on the shore after they passed away and we had ceremony for four days. Their spirits sat on what is now called Alcatraz and they waited for that last day of ceremony. And then they left to, the next world through our Western gate where the Golden Gate Bridge is today. We believe that our ancestors still do that. And it's never been our way to go on to Alcatraz. Even though Alcatraz was one of the, some of the first prisoners were native people, um, Alcatraz was not an island that our people went to. So this, this mound was destroyed and along with it, Many of our uh, human remains were taken out of it, as many as they could. They used the material to pave the streets of Berkeley and Emeryville. So quite literally, when you're walking through the streets, you could be stepping on our ancestors' remains. When in uh, 1999, 2000, they decided to clean up, it. it was a brownfield for a while, and the city of Emeryville received some money to clean it up, and they decided to put a green mall on top of it. And uh, we fought them from doing that. We asked them to clean up the green field, to clean up the creek, which is Temescal Creek now, to leave it as an open space to talk about the history and the resiliency of our people. And the city of Emeryville said, no, but we'll give you this little mound on the corner of Shell Mound Street and Ohlone Way. This tiny mound is supposed to represent thousands of years of my ancestors being in this land. They have some history there, but it always stops short because they never want to reveal that we are still here. And so I continue to say that there's a paper genocide that's continuing to happen on this colonized land against our people. So every day on the day after Thanksgiving for 20 years now, we've met at the corner of Shell Mount Street and Ohlone Way with hundreds of our supporters to give out information and to ask people not to shop there on the busiest day of the year for shopping. And um, every year we're there this year because of COVID, we won't be there, but we invite you when COVID is clean to come and meet with us the day after Thanksgiving from nine to, uh, noon to three o'clock. We continue to protect our sacred sites that they're always endangered. Our sacred sites in the Bay Area um, are continuously being uh, uh, attacked. To, um, in 2011, we took over a site along the Carquina Strait, a village called Segorite. After 12 and a half years of fighting for the city of Vallejo and the greater Vallejo Recreation District to not destroy a site that had two shell mounds on it, um, the city of Vallejo went broke in 2011. They filed bankruptcy and they gave the park district $30,000 in permits to destroy our sacred land. My friend Wounded Knee de Ocampo, who is a Miwok man who grew up in Vallejo, had been leading the charge for 12 and a half years before it got to that point. And in April of 2011, we decided that there was no other alternative but to take back our sacred village. And we stayed there for 109 days in ceremony and educating the public about why it was important to protect and preserve our sacred voice. People came from all walks of life all religions, all cultures. Um, and we made a village there that was something like my ancestors may have had thousands of, hundreds of years ago. You see Sorg Sigorite 
was one of the last strongholds of our people. They were able to stay free until 1810 and before they were taken into the missions. My ancestors uh, lived there and we thought that we were protecting that land, but we realized that the land actually protected us. When we got there and we set up this camp, we set up this, this sacred fire, Fred Short, who was the spiritual advisor for the American Indian Movement in, in Northern California, set that fire for us that burned for 109 days. We had four other fires around the world that burned as long as ours did. And we left in what we thought was victory. We left because there was a cultural easement that was set up because of our stand. It was the first cultural easement between a park district, a city and two federally recognized tribes. It's important because we are not federally recognized. So the cultural easement was set up with us, but it was because we took that stand that we were able to, to have that happen. Those that, that wrote, uh, signed off on that um, gave them the rights to the land so that the land will not be destroyed, that it will take uh, two parties to, um, to say yes uh, before any one entity could do anything. And so we, we believed that the land would be saved forever in that kind of way. And so we were grateful. But they also signed off on a thing saying that no more than 10 Indians could ever gather at that site again. And there could be no big drums there. And at first we were really angry about that until we realized that we weren't the ones that signed it. And so every year we gather generally with hundreds of people to, uh, to have ceremony there to welcome our salmon back because we're salmon people. And we work with Colleen Sisk of the Winnemumwintu and she's, uh, her people are from up in the Shasta and uh, we're trying to bring her salmon back. California native people are salmon people and it's our responsibility to, uh, to work with them. And if there's anyone in this, on this webinar that likes salmon and you live in the Bay Area, it's your responsibility as well. You see salmon are these magical fish. There's these fish that uh, they give their whole entire life for others. You salmon are born up at a, up in a river at the top of a river and they're freshwater fish when they're born and they come down the river and they hang out in our Delta. And while they're hanging out in our Delta, they go from being freshwater fish to saltwater fish. And they go out down our Carquina Strait out into our Bay. And then before they go North, they turn South. They turn south and they go down the coast of California to feed the whales who are birthing their babies. And those that are left turn back around and they go north and they go out to the ocean for up to four years. And then it's time for them to come home. And they come home, they come back through our bay and up our Carquinas and they hang out in our Delta. And they take this transformation and they go from being saltwater fish to bring in freshwater fish again. And they begin to make their way home. And as they're going home, their bodies are doing this and they're cleaning the rivers and the water that's there. And that water that we drink that comes out of our faucet conveniently is that water that those fish are cleaning. And as the salmon are going up, they begin to feed other people. They feed the bears. And as their carcasses sit on the side of the land, the nutrients from their bodies feed the plants and the trees around it. And as they get up to a particular part, they might come to a cross in the rivers and they don't go up any river, they only go up their own river. And as they get to the top of their river and they lay their eggs, they die. They've done their journey, their job, that's their job, that's their sacred responsibility. You see dams um, like the Shasta Dam that stops uh, Colleen's salmon from coming home um, are trying to be built up even higher and they're really bad for our environment. And we need to bring more water so that they can survive. And so it's our responsibility. There's a story like Lindsay told the story about my ancestors being chased. There was another story that was told about my ancestors being chased up to the Carquinas Strait. 
And when they got to the Carquina Strait, uh, they lost my ancestors, but they came during a salmon run. And when they looked over into the waters, they wrote in their diaries that there were so many silverbacks from salmon, you could practically walk across to the other side. In my lifetime, we have never seen a salmon run like that. But less than 200 years ago, that was the truth in our territories. In 2015, we stood against the canonization of Junipero Serra. Junipero Serra was the person that brought genocide to our people and to California natives. He created the first nine of 21 missions that were here um, without regard to our people. The Pope decided to make this horrific person a, uh, a saint. I grew up in Catholicism and I know that when you have a saint, you ask the saint to be your interpreter to God. You ask them to create miracles for you. And I, for, you know, although I'm a, uh, not a Catholic anymore, I knew that this was the way of the church. And so I could not understand how it would be possible for us to pray to someone that created genocide on our people. You know, I liken it to, you know, somebody like Hitler and Jews having to pray to him and asking him for miracles. How is this possible that the Catholic church could do this horrific thing and create this, uh, make this man uh, a saint? So we fought against it. Uh, we fought against it here and all over the country. It wasn't just California native people, although we did band together at our missions to ask the, the, uh, the Pope not to do this. You know, Elias Castillo sent his book uh, about, uh, about the genocide of California natives in the church to him. Uh, there was petitions. We had thousands and thousands of petitions uh, written and people from all over, all many native people from all over the country began to set up these truth talks. And we lost that fight when Ipero Sarah became a saint. But in this fight, we promised to each other that we would only tell the truth to history about what happened to our people, how the Catholic church had created the destruction on our lands and how we are still trying to find our way home. Oh, it's not moving. There we go. Berkeley has a sacred landscape that no one talks about because it's covered by asphalt and, and uh, buildings now. And you can't see a landscape really. You can see Campanile, you can see, uh, you can see some other things in Berkeley, but you can't see this natural landscape of sacredness that my ancestors had. And this is just one place. You know, I think that people don't realize that there's sacred places all over the Bay Area that you don't have access to because you don't know what you're look for anymore uh, because there's a disconnect of, of what has happened. I've been fighting for the West Berkeley Shell Mound for four and a half years. And this is the oldest of the 425 shell mounds that ring the Bay Area. Up above there is Indian Rock. And Indian Rock is a place of ceremony where Mortar Park is and it's in a residential area and people use it to learn how to rock climb. And it was a place of reverence that looked into our Western gate. And if you come across this to this triad, you go over to UC Berkeley and UC Berkeley where Faculty Glade is and, and underneath the faculty building and the stadium where, Sarah, where uh, village sites and ceremonial places along Strawberry Creek uh, that went straight down to the West Berkeley Shell Mound. These, this triad is just one of many in the Bay Area that are invisible because our lands have been covered over by asphalt. The West Berkeley Shell Mound, the oldest one on Nels Nelson's map. This bottom picture is a picture of what uh, the, the uh, remains of it had been left, um, is the oldest one. And a few years ago, about four and a half years ago, a developer came and wanted to create um, high rise condominiums and big box shopping on 4th Street. It's on 4th and University where it looks like a parking lot. And this land had been designated as a landmark over 20 years ago by the uh, city of Berkeley. 
and uh, we fought against it. We had thousands of people that, sh uh, that wrote letters. We had hundreds of people show up to zoning board meetings and landmark commissions meetings um, talking about why it's important to save this last 2.2 acres of land. We're talking about a posted stamp when we're looking at the Bay Area and what lands are left to the native people. This, um, after the last meeting, uh, we realized that the only picture in people's minds was this picture that the developer had put together. I even had this little old lady come up to me at the end of a zoning board meeting and say, why don't we just give a little corner to the Indians with a plaque and then just let this happen, which is always what happens with us. And I met somebody and I always believed that the ancestors bring me people into my life that's supposed to cross my path so that we can do this work together. And so he came to me, his name is Chris Walker and he's a landscape architect. And he said, let's sit down together and let's dream of what this could be. Let's dream of opening up Strawberry Creek where it had once been. Let's build up the land so that we don't ever have to dig into it. And we could plant oak trees and we could put an arbor there and we could create this mound that, that people could walk up to. It's not a shell mound, it's not an earthen mound. It's actually a, a container. It's a building that people are using. It's uh, made out of, I think it's cement. Uh, it was made by college students. It was a contest to see um, if uh, what could withstand a punch or a, uh, uh, some kind of a pressure on it without a candle blowing out inside of it. And so they're using this construction all over the world in places. It would, but if you could imagine going up to the top and it's covered with poppies and four months out of the year, it's bright orange. And inside you can imagine a theater in the middle that's 360 degrees. And as you sit in the middle of that movie going on, you can hear, see, smell, and feel what it was like to be at a shell mound 200 years ago. And that we can talk about the past, but we could also talk about the resiliency of us still being here and relearning our languages and our culture and our songs. Ohlone um, territory is now on the city of Berkeley signs coming into it. It's part of the relationship building that the tribe has done with the city of Berkeley, that the city of Berkeley has really heard that we are, that they are on our territory and want to recognize that in different ways. During the uprising a few months ago, when the country was putting in Black Lives Matters on their streets, the city of Berkeley put that in, but they also said the two African-American um, council people said, we're going to do that. And we want a second mural, a second mural designating that we are also on Ohlone territory and not to forget that. And so this relationship with the city of Berkeley has grown through this challenging time of trying to save our West Berkeley shell mound. A few weeks ago, the West Berkeley Shell Mound was named one of the 11 most endangered historic places in the nation. This designation is only given to 11 places a year, 300 different places every year try for out for it. And we were given that designation. The designation allows us to have a platform to talk about why it's important to protect this site. And 95% of those that are placed on this, uh, this designation list actually get saved. So it's given me hope that our dream can come, um, come to fruition. We start back, we uh, started the land trust after we left Sagorite um, a few years ago. And we started it um, and was given the first piece of land. The Sagorite Land Trust is an urban indigenous women led land trust for a particular reasons. I after the, the, um, the takeover of our land, in 2011, I was invited by Beth Rose Middleton, who's a professor at UC Davis. And she did her dissertation at Berkeley and wrote a book called Trust in the Land. And the land is about native land trusts. And she invited me to a meeting in Southern California right after uh, we left Segorite. And I didn't understand why I was going to this meeting, but I trusted her. And I went to this meeting and there was a handful of native tribes, both federally recognized and not, that were at this weekend meeting talking about buying back our traditional lands, about saving and protecting our sacred sites, about creating a reconnection to the lands that we're on. And so 
um, I was, when I was there, it was amazing to hear this because I never really knew what a land trust was and why it was important. And especially listening to native people talk about it. But what I did notice while I was there was that it was 98% men uh, that were there. And I met this uh, amazing activist, Dune Lankard from Alaska. And he was able to save 140 or 144,000 acres of his traditional territory after the Exxon Valdez spill. We were having lunch one of the afternoons and he, um, and I asked him a question. I said, hey, Dune, I said, is this a boys club? And Dune started laughing, but he said, yeah, pretty much. Not only indigenous uh, land trusts, but uh, other land trusts are mostly run by men. And I was, uh, I was curious about that. I came back and I had a conversation with my, the co-founder of Segorite, the co-founder of Indian People Organizing for Change, Janela LaRose. And we began to talk about this idea of using a land trust as a way of bringing land back into indigenous hands. And especially as a non-federally recognized tribe, how do we do that? You see, the institutions in the Bay Area hold my ancestral remains. UC Berkeley has over 9,000 of our ancestors and our funerary objects in its possession. I mean, DVC has uh, our remains at the school. We have every institution probably in the Bay Area has some of our remains there. Our prayer has been to bring these ancestors home and to put them back into the land. But as non-federally recognized, we have no land base. And so what does that mean? Imagine how much land you need in order to lay over 9,000 people to rest. And this isn't just old stuff that's happening. You know, last week I was called into Alameda because there is a big development happening and they're thinking that they might try to remove 50 to 100 of our ancestors. So this is an ongoing process, a continual genocide and disrespect of our cemeteries. But we had this conversation, I'll go back to that, the conversation of, of, an, of, of an indigenous women-led land trust. And it was, it was important to be an indigenous women-led land trust. It's on our territory, but there are so many indigenous women that have come to live in our territory through forced relocation processes of the United States government, Many people have been here since the 50s and 60s. Some of them are continue to be uh, poor and can't make it back home. And so there needed to be places for indigenous people to reconnect, not parks, but sovereign pieces of land where we could do our languages and our ceremonies and we can grow food and medicine, a place where native people could just be native people. This was important also to think about what has this history taught us about men being in charge of land? For hundreds of years, men have been in charge of land. They have done things to the land that is unthinkable. They have raped the land. They have extracted things. They have soiled it and dirtied it. But the very same thing that they have done to the land, they've done to women in our bodies. So it's important for us to think about where is the balance that's missing? You see in our ceremonies, it tells us that right now is the time for women to stand up in our rightful place, a time for us to bring that balance back. So it's an urban indigenous women-led land trust, but it doesn't mean that we leave our sons and our grandsons and our uncles and our brothers behind. It means that there's been things because of colonization that has brought this imbalance and we have to bring it back into balance. Women have songs for our medicine plants and our water. Our children's umbilical cords are buried in the land for thousands of years. And so for this land, our earth to come back into balance, women need to take care of it in a different kind of way and bring our brothers and sisters, our brothers with us. If we look around today at the, what's happening around the world during COVID and you look at the, the uh, countries that are being run by women, they're doing so much better than those that have been run by men because women take care of their people. 
And so it's a different way of looking at the world. And so Segorite Land Trust was started on that idea. And a few years ago, we were given the first quarter acre of land in our territory back. It's a half mile walk from my house. It's on the Lashawn Creek, probably one of our village sites. These ancestors do crazy, amazing things out of our wildest dreams. Janelle and I have been working for over 20 years. This was something that we had not thought possible, maybe not even dreamed of, but these ancestors dreamed it up for us. These young people that owned a company, an organization, an organic farm called Planting Justice, working with formerly incarcerated uh, men and women, uh, went to Standing Rock. And when they came, went to Standing Rock, they were so moved, they asked the elders what they can do when they came home. And the elders said, you should work with the First Nation people on whose land you're on. And they took that to heart. And there was an Ask the Baskin uh, elder who we've known for decades, working with them as an educator. And she said, you need to talk to Janelle and Karina. And so finally we went and met with them and sat underneath the California walnut tree in the back of this land, this two acres of land in Oakland. And they said, we told us that story. And they said, we'd like to give you this quarter acre of land that we're not using. And uh, we cried, I cry still. Um, and we took that land and we worked the land with people from all walks of life because we're not the only ones here. And the healing is not just for us, it's for everybody that lives in our territory. You see, we wanna be good hosts, but we need good guests. And fourth graders really know what it means to be a good guest because as adults, as parents, as grandparents, as aunties and uncles, we, we, we tell little guys how they're supposed to behave when they're somebody's guest. When you go to your best friend's house or your grandma's house, how do you behave yourself? And fourth graders say, oh, that's easy. We don't touch things that aren't ours. We say thank you and please. We ask permission. We don't break things. And that's pretty easy for us to understand as adults to tell our children. But as adults, we forget that we're in someone else's home. This is someone else's territory and that we have responsibilities for our guests, but we can't be good hosts if we don't have good guests. It's living in reciprocity with each other. It's learning how to ask permission and not to break things. It's learning how to be in relationship with First Nations people we are working on bringing back our language and our cultural revitalization through the work of Segorite. We are able to, uh, to, to take up our Thule again and to teach ourselves and others about the names of our medicines. We work on our land with people of all walks of life to create a better place. And as we begin to work the land and we begin to sing and we begin to share food together and medicines together, our community grows stronger. You see, we're still here. We're not the pictures of the past. This is a small portion of our tribe and we still stand together on our lands. We still sing our songs. We still do our language. We still have obligations to our sacred sites. And we need everyone that lives in our territory to be good guests so that we can do the work that we are supposed to do. You see, prayers are not just for us. They are prayers for the people that live in our territories now. Our future generation is here. These are three of my four grandchildren. If we don't do this work, and we, if we don't do this work together, the genocide the genocidal project that was planned for us will be complete. And as a grandmother, as a leader of our tribe, I can't see that happen. And so I depend on everyone that's listening to share these stories and to be good guests and to work with us to create a better world for the next seven generations and beyond. Oh, 
I just need to breathe for a little bit. Let you breathe too, dear friend. Karina, you are just one of the people in my life who I am so glad to know. Just so glad to, um, I'm so glad that our ancestors brought, brought you into my life, brought, brought us together. Um, we've known each other a long time. And so there's been times that I've gotten to hear different parts of, of this story and think something about hearing, getting to listen to you and, and how, how generously and how, um, how uh, like I'm thinking about the pacing, the deliberateness of the pacing of your story. It is so much about um, like finding the salmon people and finding the people who are going to make that journey and going to make that journey in a way that takes care of others along the way. Um, there's a couple of things that you said today that I am so interested in hearing more about or thinking more with you about um, that I think are part of part of the 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 things that you have learned from these different stories. Um, so one of those is when you were talking about Segura Tay, um, being at Segura Tay in 2011. And one of the things that you said is we thought we were protecting the land. And what we learned is that the land is protecting us. Another thing that you said is um, that the, the healing that work that you're doing is not just for us, but it's for everybody in the territory. And so as I'm thinking about what I've learned so much from you and your work is about loving land and being in relationship to land, even when that land is covered by asphalt even when it feels like something has been brought to its brink and it's not recognizable anymore, that we can imagine something, you know, even in the way that you're talking about those plans, those possible plans for, for Berkeley um, and that, that building with the winding path. Those are some of the things that I heard you talk about today that if you were up for it, I'd love to hear you linger over a little bit longer. Loving land, even when it's covered with asphalt. Healing that's not just for us, but for everybody in the territory. And thinking that we're protecting the land, but the land is protecting us. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Eve. It's so good to see you. And I can't wait to hug you guys again. <laughs> um, yeah, the, so the, um, you know, that it was John Ella who actually said that first, that we went to Segorite thinking we were going to save the land and the land saved us. And it really is true. We learned how to be human beings again. We learned how to live in reciprocity with each other and with the land. We learned to be in ceremony every day. If you look at my, you know, some of the, the big things that we've seen recently, with Standing Rock and their ceremony that was there every day. Our sisters and brothers on Mauna Kea when their ceremony four times a day up on that mountain when they were on it, that our people know when you go there, and it's not just us as indigenous people, anybody that shows up there and is able to give themselves to that space and time realizes that that's how we're supposed to live that our ancestors and our creator intended us to live in that way, that there is always enough food, that there is sharing and reciprocity, that there's not a need to ask anybody to do anything 
because people figure out what their job is and they do it and they do it well. When we were at Segorte, we had people that, you know, as the organizers, we were trying to make sure that people were safe. Um, we had, you know, uh, Coast Guard on the water and police coming in and uh, Homeland Security and all of that kind of stuff happening there. And we wanted to make sure that we protected the fire and the children and women. And But, you know, when people are living together, who's taking out the trash and who's, you know, who's making the coffee in the morning? That's my big worry, right? Because um, I'm not a early morning person, but I do want coffee. And people that came together to live together figured out what their job was. And somebody that got up really early in the morning, every morning made sure that pot of coffee was on. And when they turned off the water, someone from the neighborhood, before they went to work, brought us water. And on his way home, came and picked up the empty containers and took them with him and created that as their job. And when his cardboard was stacked up, someone came and picked it up and took it with them. And so there was always that happening, that people figured out how to live with each other in that kind of a way, how to wake up every morning and come around the fire and pray. And people learned as they were coming through that gate that their obligation was to put medicine on that fire and to say a prayer, no matter what denomination you were. And for to live like that for 109 days and then have to come back to this reality was depressing and unsettling. And I know that other people that have been in occupations understand what that means because you live in a time where, where you're, you're eating together and you're laughing together, you're crying together and you're fighting for something that you're willing to put everything on the line for. But we knew that when we came home from Segorite, after it took, it took six months literally for me to read a book or to turn on a TV and to be able to watch a, a show because I could not get out of this time space. Time changed when we were there. When we talk about the land changed us. There would be days where you'd wake up in the morning and all of a sudden it was night and you had no idea what happened in between. That there was this ceremonial time that was happening that can't be explained in Western linear time. And so we knew that there are things. I believe that people that went to Segorte and experienced that our DNA changed. I changed. My kids will tell you that I changed. I became somebody different in that time. That experience changed me in a physical and spiritual and emotional way. And, um, and I think that, that when Janelle and I realized that that happened, that we said that there needs to be something that happens here when we come home, that people need that point of reference, that place where they could be human beings with each other, that when you come across this land, you remember that everybody is your relative and that's how you greet them as your uncle or your brother or your cousin, that we're all in relationship to each other. And that when we create these circles of prayer, that this hearth that we're trying to bring people back to this fire, that that fire is, is there for everybody. I believe the Bay Area is magic. I believe that there are so many things that have been created here in the Bay Area, movements and technology and ideas that that is um, not by mistake or coincidence but that my ancestors have been putting down prayers on this land for thousands of years. And that those, and this ripple effect of all of that goodness is because of those prayers. And who are we to stand in the way of that? I believe as human beings, we are just a bridge right now between the past and the future. And so it's our responsibility to make sure that those next ones that come along have more than we have right now. 200 years ago, there was fresh water. Well, 200 years from now, there needs to be fresh water. And it's our responsibility right now to make sure that that happens. It's not for the next generation to fix that. It's for us to fix it. 
so many older generations said, oh, I'm so sorry that we left that for you to clean up. That is not what I want to say to my children and my grandchildren. I want to say, how do we help each other figure this out in a place, in a world right now where there's all of these ideas, where we have the ideas to do it? We need to step away from the corporate idea of money and fix it for everybody. And that's really what this is about, is really trying to figure out how do we do this for, for everyone. So when I say that this is for everyone, it is for everyone. Indigenous people are not going to survive by ourselves. But we need to be able to be in places where we can talk about our Indigenous knowledges and why it's important for us to follow those knowledges so that we can go back in order to go forward. When we talk about, I, I often, I was a part of a uh, meeting a few years ago about what does the Bay Area look like in a hundred years. And my dream is that the, that our cities will get smaller, not larger. And that we go back to a time or when everything you needed was in within walking and biking distance and we're off of fossil fuels and that we're generating food for ourselves and that the water is clean again, and that we have all of those, thi those, those things that are necessary. We look at a time right now where we're in COVID and people are having to sit still. And we saw early on how the humans just had to sit still for a little while before the earth began to heal herself. And the water started to get cleaner and the airs that were polluted in India cleared up. And there was animals that came back into the cities where they had been all along. I really loved that the coyotes were walking through San Francisco. And so if we could see in just a short amount of time that humans impact on the world has been great. And if we sit down long enough, she has time to rest and rejuvenate. We need to figure out how to do that in a, in a sustainable way. We need to figure out how, how, do we, how we're able to, to allow that to happen because we have one earth in order to do this. We have to be, uh, we have to give, if we can give corporations personhood, then we can give waterways and mountains and forests personhood as well. We can do that and then that can change a whole bunch. It can save not just those mountains and waterways, it's going to save us as human beings. And so, I don't know. I think I got off track, Eve. You're on that decolonial time. Um, I, I, there are tons of questions and much love in the Q&A. I hope we get to save the Q&A later. Um, and, um, and I just want to apologize to the folks out there. We're not going to be able to answer all these questions. Um, I, I feel like... Um, one that I, I think resonates with what you're saying right now is from um, um, Anne-Marie Sayer's daughter, I want to say. It's probably Canyon Sayer Roots is my guess. Uh, yep, yep. Is, uh, wants to know, she says that her mother says, now is the best time to be alive as an Indigenous person since contact. And do you feel similarly? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Making it so, right? Uh, no, I definitely think that it's uh, an amazing time to be alive right now. And I thank the ancestors for putting me on this earth at this time so that we can begin to have the conversations. You know, it's amazing work that's happening within indigenous people all over the world right now that, um, that it's happening in our territory. But I am so thankful for our, our Maori brothers and sisters that are doing the work over there, the folks in the Pacific, our, our, our relatives that are in Central America, in the Amazon that is holding the line to stop uh, the destruction of our lungs of the earth. You know, I'm, I'm thankful for, for indigenous knowledges that are still alive and being practiced. And, and it's, a, it's an amazing time to be alive so that we can be in this virtual space able to talk to each other across all kinds of territorial lines so that we can share this, uh, this knowledge with each other. And so, yes, I agree with Anne-Marie. Um, it is a wonderful time to be alive as an indigenous person. So, 
Can There's a very that. short question that is very relevant to um, where we are in terms of Diablo Valley College, um, which is should should we use Saklan or uh, Takwan um, in place of Ohlone when acknowledging where the college is? Uh, yes, um, because we're not you're not in Ohlone territory proper. You're in Bay Miwok territory, and even though Bay Miwok was also one of our tribes. Um, you're not in Ohlone territory. And so that's important to know whose land you're on. I mean, you're still in my land, but it's called something different. Yeah. And I wanted to see if Lindsay, you had a question and then maybe Eve has a question and then we're going to pass it. Um, we're going to try to bring things to a close. Okay. Um, hmm. I didn't prepare a question, but the thing that is uh, resonating for me right now in terms of thinking about moving from here is, um, Karina, if you could share a little more about, you shared about um, the city of Berkeley ma making steps towards being in right relationship. And um, just if there's things, I'm, I'm not asking you to lay out how to do it. I'm asking you if there's um, things you wanna leave us with about how as guests on um, on this land, what are steps that individuals and institutions should be, steps is not the right word, but towards that end, I think you understand my question, even though it's not the most eloquently asked. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah. Um, I think that that's a question that people are now coming to. And, uh, and I love to have conversations with people. I think that each institution, each community organization has a different way of doing it. And we're open to doing that. As we're beginning to get land back returned to us, um, each of those situations has been different. I think that people are now at this point where it's like, it took us over 20 years to realize that Ohlone people are still alive and well in their territories and that people are speaking of us in our own names and are beginning to become in right relationship through paying Shaumi tax and coming to work days when they can and trying to figure out relationships in a different kind of way. Uh, I think institutions are becoming more aware of uh, sitting down and having conversations about repatriation of our ancestors and our funerary objects and um, more, more willing to do that. Um, I think that each government uh, has their own way of doing it. And we're hoping that, you know, eventually we will have city uh, and county governments doing land acknowledgements as they do in uh, Canada and, uh, and in Australia and other places around the world, um, that that's not happening here. We have some institutions that are doing it, but uh, our, our government institutions are not doing that yet and we're hoping to push that um, and so people come to us with different ways of being in right relationship bringing us seeds that they've gathered so that we can grow them uh, sharing food that we can distribute um, with our food distribution project um, providing us with uh, with funding so that we could do the work that needs to be done um, so there's lots of different ways to come in right relationship um, with the people of the land but I think the first thing to do is to acknowledge where you're at and then contact us to find out how that relationship can be built. I won't ask a final question. I will just again express my gratitude to you, Karina, uh, for your words today, but also for your work in the world. I just um, am so grateful to Creator for you and to your family and to your children. Thank you, Eve. Sending you lots of love. Yeah, I love you. Well, that brings us to a close. A big thank you to Corina and our facilitators, uh, Eve and Wayne and Lindsay. Corina's knowledge, insight, indomitable spirit, and frankness in telling the truths of indigenous peoples will remain in our heart and intellect long after hearing her speak. Personally, I am inspired to move towards education and action. We have the opportunity to gather again on November 18th at 1 p.m. for Dr. Heather Poncheri-Daly, 
who will present on From Termination to Regeneration for California Indigenous Peoples. We'll share the registration information with you via email. If you aren't able to attend the presentation you are interested in in our series, you can view it at a later time by visiting our Equity Speaker Series video streaming site. Now I wanna remind you again to fill out the survey. Your feedback is really valuable to us, especially in a scaffolded series like this one. So please do go to the tinyurl.com slash DVC Equity Speakers 1. We hope you will join us again to keep working towards our vision of hope, healing, and community in the future. Thank you.